Hello, everyone. In my previous lectures on water quantity and quality, I frequently mentioned the importance of conditions and influences outside the freshwater system in the surrounding terrestrial systems. Freshwater health, both good and bad, is strongly influenced by conditions in the basin containing the water body. So in this lecture, we'll focus on basin condition. We'll begin by looking at the basin landscape as a whole, considering the naturalness of its land cover. Then we'll focus more specifically on the margins of water bodies, their banks and riparian areas. And finally, we'll look at the importance of connectivity in aquatic systems, which determines the ability of aquatic species to move between different aquatic habitats they need over the course of their life cycle. As before, for each I'll begin by describing conditions in their natural and healthy state, and then look at anthropogenic changes. For each topic, I'll also present one or more assessment techniques that can be used to assess the health of basin conditions. The importance of basin conditions becomes apparent when we consider that precipitation, be it rain or snow, is the source of the water we find in our rivers, lakes, and aquifers. Freshwater bodies cover less than 2% of the Earth's land surface, so nearly all precipitation falls first onto dry land, and the fraction that doesn't evaporate washes over and through the landscape and its soils, rocks, and plants, to eventually accumulate in rivers, wetlands, lakes, and aquifers. These features have a strong influence on the quantity of water flowing to one of these water bodies versus another, and the changes in water chemistry and materials washed along with the water determine the initial water quality of the water bodies. There are multiple pathways water can follow when precipitation falls on the land surface. Some will percolate through soils to be taken up by plants or enter aquifers. This water interacts with the basin's rocks as some portion of it slowly makes its way to nearby surface water bodies. It arrives with a distinct water quality reflecting the basin's geology. Another portion of precipitation, usually associated with intense rainfall events, will wash over the land surface or through the shallow subsurface to more quickly enter streams, rivers, wetlands, and lakes. This runoff water has the ability to wash particulate as well as dissolved material into rivers, the most abundant of which are generally organic matter and sediments. The organic matter washed into surface water bodies is an important source of energy for aquatic species, and the sediment is important substrate for aquatic habitats. Terrestrial animal carcasses are another source of organic matter to freshwater systems, whether the animal itself enters the water and drowns, or if its body is washed in with storm waters. This is an image of drowned wildebeest in the Mara River in Serengeti National Park, but smaller animals and insects will make up most of the animal biomass washed into freshwater systems. Now imagine the incredible diversity of natural basin landscapes across the planet, with varying climate, topography, geology, soils, plants, and animals. In each, these variables combine to influence freshwater systems in distinct ways, and the aquatic biota of these systems will be adapted to benefit from and cope with the natural influences of basin conditions. They may be quite different from each other, but all may be viewed as healthy. Today, less than 25% of terrestrial landscapes are fully natural, and in many, land cover has changed dramatically. This is a map of the southern half of the state of Florida in 1900, showing a mostly natural land cover of forests and wetlands. In less than 100 years, its land cover was converted to agriculture, mixed residential, and urban covers. These changes have had a profound impact on the unique Everglades wetland systems in the south. Deforestation and conversion of land to agriculture has been the most prolific form of land cover and land use change across the planet, and wherever it occurs there will be some level of change in the quantity of water flow to freshwater systems and the dissolved and particulate composition of that inflowing water.
Good land management practices will reduce the severity of negative impacts, but again, some level of impact on the health of freshwater systems is unavoidable. And even in areas where land is not wholly converted to different land covers, the condition of the land may decline. This is especially so on lands used for grazing animals. If good grazing practices are not employed and land is overgrazed, vegetation will degrade and soils will likely become more compacted. This leads to greater overland runoff during rain events, which causes increased erosion and harmful sediment loads to freshwater systems. In the context of freshwater health assessment, the condition of land cover in a basin can be captured by an index of naturalness. In this index, published in 2004 by Antonio Machado, land cover naturalness is assessed based on the relative proportion of natural elements versus anthropic elements and energy. A landscape composed of purely natural elements, like native species and free-flowing rivers, will be classified as natural, or even natural virgin, and given a score of 10 out of 10. But as anthropogenic influences grow, the level of naturalness declines and the score is reduced. Anthropic elements include the regulation of free-flowing rivers and the introduction of pollutants and exotic species, while anthropic energy includes external energy inputs that alter natural levels of biological production and the basin's morphology. In the User Manual for Conservation International's Freshwater Health Index, you can also find a modified version of Machado's Index, proposing naturalness characteristics with assigned weights ranging from 0 for completely artificial areas to 100 for completely natural areas. Such an approach can be used in the analysis of GIS land cover data. The total area and proportion of the total of each of eight naturalness classes are calculated and summed to arrive at a naturalness score for the whole basin or area being assessed. It's also possible to approach this assessment from the opposite perspective, choosing to assess the degree of human impact rather than naturalness. In this case, similar indexes have been developed, such as this one by Tian and others which includes seven classes of impact ranging from one, indicating almost no human impact, to seven, indicating excessively strong human impact. This and others like it are referred to as hemorrhobi indexes, as the term hemorrhobi refers to the degree of human impact. Now let's shift our focus from the health of the basin as a whole and zoom to the very margin of the freshwater system the riverbank and the riparian zone extending from it. This is an image of the Mara River as it passes through Masai Mara National Reserve in Kenya and approaches Serengeti National Park in Tanzania. We can see enough of the sprawling grasslands in the distance to realize something special is happening near the river. Grassland changes to riparian forest, indicating trees are now able to access sufficient groundwater supplied by the river. In the photo, the river is full and nearly overflowing its banks at points. This is surely one of those moments during the year when the river is recharging riparian groundwater needed by the forest. Riparian zones are unique ecological environments, referred to as ecotones, because they are transition zones between terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems. They're of enhanced ecological importance, both supplying aquatic ecosystems with resources and in some more developed landscapes, buffering them against potentially harmful pollutant influences from surrounding areas. From the meanders in the image, we see that the riverbanks are dynamic, shifting in time due to natural processes of erosion and deposition. This is a healthy part of this freshwater system a river free to change its form in response to natural forces and supporting communities of native biota. But along the margins of many freshwater systems, river banks and riparian zones have been altered by removing natural riparian biota. In the image on the left, we see that riparian forest has been converted to pasture, and riverbank erosion appears to have occurred as a consequence. On the right, we see a riparian zone converted to intense agriculture. 
depending on the land management practices of this agriculture, what was once a riparian zone buffering the adjoining river against agricultural runoff may now be the very source of it. And in more urban settings, the modification of riverbanks and riparian zones may be even more severe, erasing 100% of the former naturalness and the associated ecosystem functions. Note that such physical barriers also completely disconnect the river from riparian and potentially former floodplain areas. But we'll talk about connectivity separately. Given the alteration of riparian areas and river banks is essentially one of land cover change, the methods of assessment are similar to what we've already seen for basin naturalness. But the reduced spatial scale of the assessment allows for additional levels of detail, as reflected in the QBR index of riparian habitat quality. The initials QBR simply refer to the Catalan abbreviation of riparian forest quality. It's a method that requires surveyors to walk the margins of the river and make observations on four component factors, total riparian cover, cover structure, cover quality, and channel alteration. The criteria are understandably linked to natural conditions of riparian areas in Catalan on the east coast of Spain. Total riparian cover is focused on the percentage coverage of perennial vegetation like trees, bushes, and shrubs, while cover structure focuses on the proportion of trees and shrubs. Quality relates mainly to the number of native species present, and channel alteration relates to the degree of engineered modification of the channel. Results are reported in classes ranging from bad quality to natural condition. If assessment of larger riparian areas is the objective, methods also exist to base the assessment on remotely sensed data complemented by field data collected at select sites. The physical structural integrality approach is one such method. The method combines weighted indicators of riparian stability, river connectivity, and natural wetland conservation. And the resulting score falls on a scale of 0 to 100. And within the Freshwater Health Index Manual, you'll find a proposal to apply the same approach suggested for the wider river basin in the more focused riparian area. This approach will be most feasible when field work is not possible and results must be derived from existing spatial data. The final aspect of basin condition we'll consider is connectivity which determines the ability of matter and organisms to move through and between aquatic ecosystems. Three-dimensional connectivity is important. Longitudinal connectivity enables the natural downstream physical transport of water, sediments, energy in the form of organic matter, and entrained biotic material like seeds, algae, and larval fish. Movement upstream is important for migratory organisms. Lateral connectivity is important for maintaining floodplain and side channel environments, which rely on water, sediments, and biotic material from the main river. And rivers rely on the material washed back into them as water levels fall. These habitats are also important to river biota for feeding, for shelter, and reproduction. Finally, Vertical connectivity is important for exchange of surface and groundwater, which may sustain river flows during dry periods and is also important for regulating water quality. Migration is an ecologically important behavior enabling aquatic organisms to access different habitats and resources needed to complete their life cycles. Many fish species migrate over long distances in river systems, which requires longitudinal connectivity. A remarkable example of this is the dorado catfish of the Amazon. Young dorado catfish spend the first two years of life in the Amazon estuary, but their breeding area is in the foothills of the Andes, thousands of kilometers upstream. Their upstream migration can take a year or more as they feed and grow larger. Those completing the migration will breed in the river channel as water levels fall, and when the eggs hatch, larval fish are swept downstream to the estuary over the course of weeks. 
Not surprisingly, dam building has a large impact on river connectivity, even when fish passages are included in the design. Millions of dams have been constructed on rivers around the world, including more than 50,000 large dams affecting larger rivers. Many dams were built during the last century and have impacted rivers for decades already, but there are thousands of dams still planned and under construction, including in the Amazon. This is Santo Antonio Hydropower Dam completed in 2012 on the Madeira River, a major Andean tributary of the Amazon. Santo Antonio Dam and another dam 100 kilometers upstream have blocked the migration of the Dorado catfish, leading to declines in its population size. Continuing in the Amazon, another fish species, the tambaqui, relies on lateral connectivity in the river system as it migrates annually between the river, where it spawns, and side channels, flooded forest, and floodplain lakes where it feeds and grows. Many other fish species worldwide migrate laterally with a seasonal inundation of resource-rich floodplains. This graphic of the Danube River near Vienna, Austria in the year 1849 shows a similarly complex river landscape with a dynamic main channel, multiple side channels, and a broad floodplain. Over the next 60 years, Austrian authorities dammed side channels and built embankments along the main channel to reclaim former floodplain land for the expansion of the city and improve navigation on the river. Lateral connectivity was greatly reduced and floodplain habitats lost, leading to declines in freshwater health. Losses in lateral connectivity can be assessed directly as part of riverbank and riparian assessment techniques like the QBR index of riparian habitat quality presented earlier, or inferred by the assessment of change of riparian land use and cover described in the Freshwater Health Index Manual. Longitudinal connectivity in a river basin may be assessed using the Combined Dendritic Connectivity Index, published by Coate and others in 2009. It's referred to as a combined index because it represents connectivity relevant to both potadromous and diadromous fish species. Potadromous species are those that migrate wholly within freshwater systems, while diadromous species migrate between freshwater systems and the ocean. To calculate the index, first determine the total length L of rivers in the basin. Next, insert the barriers present in the basin and determine the length of rivers in each of the now disconnected parts of the river basin, represented by lowercase l1 through l4. The potadromous component of the index can then be quantified by summing the ratios of the squared value of river length in each part of the disconnected system to the square of the total river length. For the diadromous component of the index, simply calculate the ratio of the length of river connected to the basin outlet to the total river length. The final combined dendritic connectivity index is represented by the weighted average of the two components multiplied by 100 to move the final value into a scale of 0 to 100. In the combined equation, WP and WD are weighting factors. You'll find suggested values for these factors in the Freshwater Health Index Manual. This calculation of the index assumes no fish are able to pass the barriers in an upstream or downstream direction. If fish passages are present and you have information about how effective they are, the equations can be adjusted to allow for passability. Please refer to the paper by Coate and others to see how that is done. That brings us to the end of this lecture. We've learned that natural land covers are important sources of water, energy, and sediment to healthy freshwater systems. Riverbanks and riparian areas are of special importance, both for resources to freshwater systems as well as the protection they provide. Connectivity in freshwater systems is important for the movement of organisms, sediment, nutrients, and genetic material and human alteration of each of these components generally decreases freshwater health. We've also learned that assessment approaches and indexes exist for each of these aspects of basin condition and are useful in evaluating and communicating the condition of freshwater health. 
Thank you for your attention. Please rewind and replay any parts of the lecture that were not clear to you. When you're ready, proceed to the hands-on activity for this topic. That's the end of this lecture.